Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dr. McMurtry and I wanted to talk about nutrition today. I think nutrition is a fascinating field. It combines together a lot of really important fields from biochemistry and cell biology and exercise science, all to optimize health and improve human performance. And I love talking about it so much that if I talked about it with all the athletes that I worked with, I would end up talking about nutrition all day and I, I need to talk about other things and do other things all day. So um, I thought I would make a quick video that kind of summarized and condensed a lot of knowledge uh, into a very compact discussion. So we certainly can't talk about everything today. And even if this were a semester long course, we wouldn't be able to talk about everything. Even if this were a PhD program, you could not cover everything because there's just so much that uh, we, we've we learned and that we're still learning about. So uh, that's why it's so exciting. So let's talk about how to optimize nutrition. Now, this can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. Do you want to optimize your long your your longevity, your long-term health? Do you want to optimize your athletic performance? Uh, these are sort of, you know, overlapping but different things. And so in general, nutrition should be tailored to you to your tastes and also to what your specific athletic performance is, uh, whether it's anaerobic, whether it's more aerobic and things like that. So this is just gonna be a general overview, but feel free to um, ask questions and comment and write about things that you think are helpful for you and uh, and uh, things that we don't cover. Uh, there's, there's a lot more, so feel free to leave that in the comments below. All right. Now, a lot of athletes are really concerned about muscle nutrition, and that's okay. Muscles do a lot of the movement and activity that we do in athletics, but it's also important to be aware of nutrition for other parts of the body, especially tendons and ligaments. So I'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, tendons and ligaments uh, do a surprising amount of functions in athletics. Not only do they absorb impacts like hits in rugby and football, but we also, uh, like even in sports like climbing and running, these are very tendon specific sports where a lot of the rebound from running is uh, through tendons and bones and stiffness actually can be a great benefit to some degree. Uh, the biomechanics are really interesting there. Same thing with tendons, a lot of times in climbing we're hanging off small holds uh, with tendons and ligaments just as much as muscle and so um, and, and a lot of the injuries that I see are tendon and ligament injuries. They're not muscle injuries. I mean, you can get muscle tears and those kind of injuries, and we can diagnose all of that under ultrasound with really high resolution imaging and really pin down where the injuries are. But the vast majority of the time, these are tendinous uh, or ligamentous injuries. So that's why I want to focus on that today. So with that said, let's talk about diet in general. Uh, just really quickly. Now, again, everyone's going to have an opinion on this, and, and, and so your opinion may be different than mine, and your taste may be different than mine, and that's totally fine. It turns out that all these sort of diet fads and the specificity of what they're, what they're um, you know, selling or, or promoting, um, yeah, for some people they may work and, and be beneficial, but in general, just eating a healthy diet will get you most of the vitamins and nutrition you need. There's actually very few vitamins that you need to absolutely take every single day uh, if you're eating a healthy diet. It's more for the high metabolic demand athletes who are pushing the limits and, and trying to maximize recovery that you have to start worrying about some of these micronutrients and things. Um, but in general, you can get most of what you need just from uh, a healthy diet, primarily uh, vegetarian because of all the flavonoids and micronutrients. Uh, vitamins and minerals that are in plants and uh, of course we worry about B12 and so totally fine have meat once in a while uh, that'll get you the B12 you need in general but as we age B12 levels tend to decline and so I want to talk about some of these biohacks um, uh, for your own benefit hopefully it'll help you so the interesting thing about a plant-based diet which I've done for many years now and which I think is extraordinarily helpful and beneficial for athletes is that plants naturally have a lot of antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and um, what we would call senolytics, a lot of chemicals that we didn't really understand until the last five or 10 years, and, and we're really discovering some of the mechanisms of how they work. 
That research is fascinating. I have a lot more details and references listed on the website, alpineathleticmedicine.com backslash nutrition. Um, and that uh, will will describe sort of these mechanisms that we're elucidating. For example, with mTOR, mTOR is a major regulator of the cell metabolism, and I've done research on it myself. I've published a paper uh, describing the complexity of these pathways, but in essence, it can be boiled down to if you are having uh, a, a low calorie state or a hypoxic state, as tends to occur during phases of endurance running, endurance training, uh, aerobic activity, then um, <clears throat> and also pushing it to anaerobic activity, those those phases of exercise and and healthy form of diet with lower levels of amino acids and things like that, those all inhibit mTOR. And, and that's a good thing because that will promote and stabilize stem cell state so that stem cells in their little niche have a pocket uh, where they can thrive and rejuvenate uh, muscle and tendon tissue after they've been abused in our training cycles. And, and, and so that, that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is the telomerase activity. Again, both mTOR and telomerase were Nobel Prize winning discoveries just in the last decade. Um, or at least the Nobel Prizes were awarded in, in the last decade. And uh, telomerase being one of those first discovered in the ancient bristlecone pines. So people have tried to figure out what foods or what, you know, activities can we do that sort of activate telomerase and extend our DNA and, and help our cells have more of a lifespan, more replication cycles. And again, it turns out that all these uh, flavonoids, flavanols, and antioxidants that are in our leafy greens, um, blueberries with anthocyanin, quercetin in grapes, and in leafy green vegetables, uh, these are sort of very, very potent and beneficial uh, molecules that exist naturally. And, and can help our bodies thrive. So I've listed a lot of those on the website. You can check them out there. Everything from resveratrol, luteolin, quercetin, anthocyanins, um, so much more. So, uh, so in general, I'm just gonna group them into our natural, uh, natural sourced leafy green vegetable uh, berry type molecules. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. So these, uh, I used to neglect them, but now I'm a, a big proponent of them. I think that uh, they help not only cell repair. Now remember when we do our training cycles, cell membranes break down. We have to restore those cell membranes. Also, we don't want solid fats in general. So anything that's solid at room temperature tends to be worse for our cardiovascular system. Um, so omega-3s are an extremely healthy form of protecting our cardiovascular system and also just for cell recovery. So EPA turns out to be probably one of the best omega-3s. DHA is more important in our youth and, and for neurodevelopment and things like that early on, but as we age, um, EPA probably is a better, at least some, evi some evidence suggests that EPA is better cardiovascular protectant, but regardless, as long as you're just getting some source of omega-3 fatty acids in your diet, that's the most important thing. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to sort of this tendon strengthening, uh, tendon repair um, nutrition. So we have to understand the mechanisms of how cartilage and uh, collagen are made. So, so cartilage in, in our joints wears down over time. It's called our osteoarthritis. And uh, that's a type 2 collagen. And then also in our bones, they get thinner over time. Bones are primarily type 1 collagen with calcium and phosphate. And then we also have our tendons, which is most important for sort of athletic activities. And that also is primarily type 1 collagen with a lot of other um, sort of basement membrane glycosaminoglycans and things like that mixed in to help strengthen. And, and, and there's a lot of enzymatic work that sort of binds together these collagen fibrils. So when we look at the detailed mechanisms of how all this works, you can actually elucidate a lot of the nutrition that's necessary in order to stimulate this. And it turns out that a lot of this has been validated. And again, on the, on the references on my website, those will discuss in detail where these studies came from. So let's talk about glycine. Glycine is one of the simplest amino acids and it's one of the main uh, components of collagen. So collagen is this sort of triple helix uh, string of amino acids and every third amino acid is glycine. 
And so if you don't have enough glycine, it's very difficult to make collagen. And, and same with the amino acid proline. But it turns out that studies have shown that by taking a glycine supplement, it actually stimulates more collagen production. So uh, this is uh, extremely helpful. Now there's a lot of components to collagen uh, in addition. Collagen has to be strengthened. It has to be laid down in um, sort of efficient patterns in order for covalent binding to occur between the collagen fibrils that ultimately assemble into a big collagen fiber. So um, glycine is certainly one of the fundamental components. It's a third of the mass of uh, collagen. And, and, and so um, it, it's useful to know that by eating more glycine, um, we can actually stimulate collagen production. Now, uh, there's a lot of post-processing that occurs um, with hydroxylation of proline and lysine especially that enables that covalent binding between the fibrils of collagen. It turns out that um, enzymatic process requires copper, which normally we get in, in a healthy diet, especially if we're eating lots of vegetables. But uh, some people I found are taking high levels of zinc supplement and zinc can essentially um, bind up uh, enzymes that are involved in the transport process in our gut and uh, it can uh, inhibit the absorption of copper. So it, it is important to understand that if you're taking a zinc supplement, which is fine, zinc has a lot of benefits for cell replication and cell repair uh, as well as antioxidant activities, but um, it should be in minimal amounts uh, certainly less than 50 milligrams a day. I recommend about 25 milligrams a day. And if you're doing that, also take at least two milligrams of copper every day. But like I said, in general, you can get a lot of that from plants w without a supplement, but just something to think about there. Another way to get a lot of glycine in your diet is simply to take collagen supplements as a whole. And collagen um, it's going to have all the amino acids in collagen, obviously, proline and glycine especially. And again, studies have shown that by taking collagen supplementation, we actually increase the synthesis of collagen from the fibroblasts in our bodies. And, and so there's a lot of benefit, again, to taking collagen. You can actually do this in a variety of ways. My favorite is bone broth because it has a ton of nutrients and electrolytes and collagen. Um, from a pretty natural source, but uh, you can also do it just as jello or gelatin. Um, it's another way. Now along with this, another vitamin that's essential for collagen synthesis is vitamin C. You probably already know that uh, you know sailors who didn't take uh, citrus fruits and vitamin C on their trips would suffer from scurvy and they could actually die from it. It turns out vitamin C is essential to the hydroxylation process of proline and lysine in the cell and so without that hydroxylation process collagen cannot be covalently linked together so um, so that's why vitamin C is essential. Now you don't need huge levels of it in fact, at, at very high levels, vitamin C actually becomes a pro-oxidant rather than an antioxidant. Um, and there's some cases where that may be beneficial. For example, there's a new study that just came out this year talking about how um, magnesium helps transport of oxidative vitamin C into cancer cells. And so that's pretty interesting, especially for solid tumor cells like breast cancer and colon cancer. It, it may turn out that it's at least, you know, an adjuvant therapy um, it, it could be beneficial for these sorts of cancer, just using vitamin C and, and magnesium. I'll have to uh, put up a link to that study. But in essence, to summarize, um, glycine, collagen, vitamin C, copper, and, and one other one I haven't talked about yet, vitamin D. Turns out vitamin D has also been shown to accelerate the synthesis of collagen from fibroblasts and tenocytes. So tenocytes are the cells in the tendon. Um, so, so all those vitamins together uh, help um, with tendon repair. Uh, it, another thing that helps is growth hormone. So growth hormone, we naturally release it typically in a spike at night when we go to sleep. And that's one of the few things that actually stimulates receptors on fibroblasts and tenocytes to lay down more collagen. And, and, and so if we can maximize a normal physiologic uh, level and response uh, of growth hormone, 
then that also can best help the repair of tendons and ligaments. And one of the best ways to do that naturally is to take the glycine supplement at night before you go to bed. So, you know, about a gram, one to five grams of glycine at night. Uh, glycine is actually a neurotransmitter as well, and it's involved in the release of that growth hormone through the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So, um, so that's one way. And the other thing you can do to stimulate and augment that is to take melatonin. Studies have shown the minimal effective dose is five milligrams at night, and then you can go higher if you'd like. 10 milligrams is typically great for me. So uh, that's yet another way to stimulate the, the tendon repair process and collagen synthesis. So now what happens when tendon repair goes wrong? Uh, every day I see cases of tendonitis, tendinopathy, tendon tears, ligament tears, uh, and I can see the the pathology on ultrasound. We can see these these uh, tissue the tissue damage in the tendon, and uh, my working theory so far of what causes this sort of irreparable uh, bad <laughs> rut or cycle of tendinopathy um, has to do with sort of inflammatory mechanisms in the beginning phases of the injury. So uh, remember how I mentioned we have hydroxylysine residues that are on collagen. Those are the primary ways that collagen fibrils are cross-linked covalently. But uh, there's also a non-enzymatic way that doesn't use an enzyme. It doesn't use that copper um, cofactor to covalently link uh, hydroxylysine residues. There's another way. It turns out the aldol groups on the hydroxylysine are highly reactive. They react with sugar as well. And so naturally in our tendon, we have these um, basically glucose-based covalent linkages between collagen fibrils. But in cases of uh, inflammation and, and uh, early tendonitis, uh, sugar can react quickly with those hydroxylysine residues. And when cells are inflamed or damaged, they release intracellular contents, including high, small but high localized concentrations of sugar. And that sugar binds up the availability of those hydroxylysine residues on the collagen, meaning that when new collagen is synthesized, it has no way to bind onto the old collagen and to continue making this very tight band of collagen fibrils. And so what we can actually see on ultrasound in the clinic is a thickened tendon. You can see the little fibrils, they're more swollen. Um, and uh, sometimes we'll see intrasubstance tears where the vessel that runs through the tendon basically is trying to feed uh, these, these tendon uh, fibrils, the, the collagen fibrils, but they're not able to grab onto each other and tighten. And, and mature into these very strong covalent leakages between fibrils. And so I've spent the last couple of years researching the best mechanisms and the best therapies for resolving these tendinopathies. And I think I've hit on some really fascinating things. I'll talk about it more in another video. Uh, next thing I wanna talk about is glutathione. Glutathione is the main antioxidant in our bloodstream and uh, it is synthesized from a couple different things, glycine being one of the predominant ones and two other amino acids, and it requires glucose in its synthesis. And so for most people, it may not be an issue, but for athletes who, under, who are under extreme uh, aerobic uh, oxidative stress for long periods of time in their training, uh, they tend to deplete glutathione. And glutathione cannot be absorbed orally. It's uh, digested apart into, into its components before it even crosses into the bloodstream. But we can actually give it as an injection into the bloodstream and uh, restore those levels either before a race or as, as a potent antioxidant um, or after a race for recovery. So along with that, uh, B12 is also a vitamin that generally we get sufficient of in, in most um, meat-based diets. Uh, even small amounts of meat can typically get us the B12 we need in our youth. But as we age, our ability to absorb B12 and our ability uh, to keep B12 in our system declines. That's been shown in several studies. And uh, it's actually been suggested that B12 is one of the uh, causes of sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle wasting. So. 
Um, so again, for athletes, in, in order to maintain B12 levels, um, we can do injections and, and ensure that B12 levels are adequate. B12 is one of those things that would be very hard to overdose on, um, so it's better to make sure it's topped off. It has a lot of other benefits as well. Uh, along with the water-soluble vitamins, uh, water-soluble B vitamins, uh, we have B6. B6 is one that you don't want to take in excess. It can cause neuropathies and, and other toxicities, but, uh, but it's still essential um, and, and along with that folate. So these three, folate, B6, and B12, they act sort of as methyl donors, which is essential for both um, epigenetic uh, landscapes of, of how genes are turned on and off, and also for DNA replication, which is essential when you're training, your cells have to replicate and, and, and restore themselves, either stem cells differentiating into things like muscle cells or muscle cells themselves dividing and, and creating uh, new muscle components to restore damage that was done. So all of these things are essential. If you lack one of them, it can affect all the others. Uh, in fact, typically you wanna make sure your B12 levels are high before you take a folate supplement because it can actually have a <laughs> sort of counterproductive uh, effect there. And then in addition to that, uh, it turns out that B12, if, if it's low, you actually can get high levels of homocysteine. Homocysteine is uh, an oxidative agent that causes a lot of cardiovascular disease. And interesting, it's actually been shown to cause tendon damage as well. So again, another reason to normalize B12 levels is to ensure that you don't get tendon damage. Um, now I mentioned the methyl donor mechanism. That also is involves a lot of other things. For example, betaine, um, or however you want to pronounce it. Uh, there's a couple different ways to pronounce it. Um, that is uh, uh, it's found in a lot of fruit, uh, a lot of vegetables, especially beets and other things like that. I prefer to get my source from beets, and it's one of the few things I found that seems to actually uh, help uh, my endurance performance. And it's been shown in other studies as well to possibly have an ergogenic effect, which means that it um, enhances endurance performance. Uh, vitamin D has a lot of good effects on muscle, bone, um, it's essential for calcium homeostasis. Calcium obviously is needed for a lot of cell functions, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, for those who are concerned about osteopenia as they age, uh, most evidence suggests that the simplest and, and easiest way of preventing and, and ensuring good bone health is just to take vitamin D, like a thousand international units per day. Uh, along with natural sources of calcium, so milk and cheese. Um, you can take calcium supplements. There, there's a couple issues we can get into with that, but, um, but in general, not, nothing wrong with it. Um, and, uh, and, and then along with that, a collagen supplement, because remember, collagen is one of the main proteins in bone. And then in addition, just weight-bearing exercises uh, and physical activity. So. Uh, there are obviously medical therapies and other and other therapies that can be done to augment uh, bone density, but that's the simplest explanation for now. As far as calcium goes, calcium is essential in numerous cell signaling pathways in almost every type of cell, especially in muscle cells where it's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, where it's stored and then initiates that binding pathway between actin and myosin. Um, and uh, in most cases, we get enough in our diet, especially if we're eating calcium-rich foods, and in some cases, supplementation may be necessary. There's some small evidence, at least in vitro, that high calcium levels, though, actually decrease collagen synthesis from fibroblasts, and so I typically recommend just sticking with natural sources of calcium, but uh, it's always worth testing for just to make sure that athletes are not depleting it, along with calcium and then an associated and yet sort of antagonistic in some mechanisms uh, element is uh, magnesium. So magnesium uh, can actually activate vitamin D and absorption of calcium and things like that. And it's actually essential also for replenishment of potassium, which is also often depleted in endurance athletes. And, and so this is another one that I highly recommend testing for and supplementing with even because magnesium is also an antioxidant, has a lot of good effects. And so if there's any suspicion at all that you might be low on magnesium, 
um, is worth taking a supplement. But again, if you're eating lots of healthy uh, vegetable-based, uh, vegetable-focused diet, then uh, you should have enough magnesium. Same thing with manganese, which again is essential in uh, collagen synthesis. I might have not talked about that in detail, but um, it can certainly help with collagen synthesis. But it's also toxic in high amounts, so it's not something you typically want to supplement with, especially if you're eating a healthy diet. Let's talk about um, sort of the new kids on the block uh, in terms of anti-aging. So in the last sort of five years or so, anti-aging has really become a legitimate science where a lot of really interesting articles have been published in prestigious journals and uh, mechanisms have been elucidated. One of those has to do with nicotinamide riboside or basically a vitamin B3 variants. So niacin is probably the best known version of this. You can take niacin supplements. It's well known to increase HDL, which is your good cholesterol. Uh, it tends to flush or vasodilate you and um, and, and it has good effects. Niacin is basically one of the essential components of the Krebs cycle. Uh, it's, it's used to make uh, nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide, uh, or NAD, which is what we put the electrons and hydrogens onto in the Krebs cycle to create energy, which ultimately goes to the mitochondria and makes ATP. Um, but NADH itself is an energy storage unit, but when you supplement with niacin by itself, it uh, is essentially like making molecules that haven't been energized yet. Uh, it, it basically is mimicking an energy deficient state. Um, and interestingly, some forms of niacin, so for example, nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, or nicotinamide riboside especially, have been shown in these scientific studies to um, essentially reduce several markers of age in the cell. Uh, that has to that, that includes DNA repair mechanisms and suppression of inflammation and activation of sirtuin genes. Uh, sirtuin genes have been shown to be involved in numerous um, sort of protective and healing and anti-aging effects within the cell. And it turns out that uh, getting adequate, amount, adequate amounts of these elements, so niacin typically is easy to get a sufficient amount in our diet, but to get these more effective variants um, in this cytoprotective realm, uh, like the, the NR, the nicotinamide riboside, uh, it's, a, it's present in small amounts in milk. Um, and I, I like milk for a lot of reasons, calcium, protein, all those things. Uh, but it, it'd be hard to get actually sufficient or uh, significant quant quantities of nicotinamide riboside just from milk. And so it is sold as a supplement, but there's sort of a patent dispute about it right now. So um, anyway, we can inject it in the clinic uh, for people who are deficient in it. Studies have shown that it's safe and that it is. Uh, it, it takes a ramp up period. So to get it back to high levels in your body, uh, it takes a couple weeks, but injections are a faster way of doing that than oral absorption. But either way, it's it's something that I recommend. Now, it's interesting because when they did these studies on rodents, you know, they had like mice running on treadmills and things, and the ones that got the NAD, they were just cruising, and even the old age mice were just running, 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 and wouldn't stop. And, and, and so it makes you think, wow, like this is going to make my performance extraordinary. But I'll be honest, myself having tried this, I haven't noticed like a, a tremendous effect in my running. I feel like um, that there is an effect, but there, yeah, the first time that I took a dose of it, it was essentially that my brain felt like tired, like <laughs> like I truly was in an energy energy deficient state. So um, so that was interesting, but. Uh, overall, I think as the levels ramp up, uh, it gets better and better. Another supplement which has been shown to impart uh, performance benefit uh, are HDAC inhibitors. So uh, these are histone deacetylase inhibitors, and you can find a lot of them naturally in plants again, which again is part of the reason that I recommend a, a plant-focused diet. So uh, in, in, in carrots and green leafy vegetables and all these things, you can find uh, substances like quercetin, uh, luteolin, 
and then coffee, caffeic acid, um, even butyrate, which has come out now as sort of a gut health prebiotic supplement and, and seems to have good results. Um, all these, all these um, agents are essentially, they can act as histone deacetylase inhibitors. Well, what does that do? Well, again, it can change uh, the epigenetic landscape of DNA and DNA expression. It has shown anti-inflammatory effects, and there have even been studies, at least in animals, showing that it has an endurance benefit, and that <laughs> even in rodents, it, it, it significantly increased their hanging endurance, their hanging power, um, things like that. I guess they were putting little rodents on hanging bar on pull-up bars. Uh, it does seem like these actually impart some sort of performance benefit and so again useful to have a plant-focused diet. Uh, another uh, aspect I'd like to talk about is potassium. So um, a lot of people think electrolytes are, are you know they've kind of washed out they're not th that important and I think a lot of that came from sort of the uh, heavy promotion of things like Gatorade and stuff and and ultimately people realized these don't really prevent cramping. I'm not really sure what benefit they're giving me. They just have a lot of sugar, and, and those are all appropriate concerns. But uh, having worked myself in critical care for many years, I've realized that electrolytes are an essential part of, of uh, proper physiology, and especially for athletes and performance. And it's surprising how quickly um, electrolytes can get out of balance in certain cases. So for the most part, our kidneys do an extraordinary job of balancing acid and base and balancing uh, sodium and potassium and chloride and bicarb and all these different things in our blood. Um, but uh, for athletes in particular, uh, these things can get out of whack under uh, sort of, you know, duress and extraordinary circumstances. Um, extraordinary performance such as long distance events or high altitude events and so uh, part of what I do is uh, altitude med high altitude medicine and wilderness medicine and also just for people who run marathons and ultra marathons making sure that these electrolytes uh, stay within normal levels now it's interesting you would think oh they just all get depleted but that's not the case if you study marathon runners at the end of a race you'll find that almost as many of them have a high potassium at the end of the race as have a low potassium. And part of that has to do with the fact that they're dehydrated, so the volume is contracted, and also their muscles have been, uh, you know, contracting over and over again for all this time, and every time you do that, you release a little bit of potassium from inside the cell. So there, there's a lot of really interesting overlapping complex mechanisms that regulate our electrolytes. but. Potassium is one of those important ones that can actually get depleted, and so you'll see a lot of um, ultra marathoners actually do take potassium supplements. And when potassium is depleted, it tends to be associated with a metabolic alkalosis uh, for a couple different me mechanistic reasons. And then, um, uh, so when you're sort of restoring or rehydrating or recovering, after this sort of event. It's important to understand how these electrolytes uh, alter and change. It's not just the concentrations, it's also the amounts, um, which can be um, directly associated or inversely associated. And so uh, maybe someday I'll make a video on all of that. But in essence, um, potassium is just another important uh, atom to think about. All right, going back to uh, fatty acids and the omega-3s that we talked about, uh, some associated supplements here. Uh, that seem to be useful in athletes. One of them is alpha-GPC or alpha-glycerol phosphorylcholine. This is a precursor for a lot of things and, and similarly there's another one, so CDP-choline. These can provide um, precursors for glutathione production and cell membrane repair and they, uh, alpha-GPC has actually shown some endurance performance benefit in athletes uh, there's a study on that that's linked on the website. It also showed increased isometric strength, increased release of your natural growth hormone, and, and other benefits. Part of the mechanism here is probably uh, its conversion to phosphatidylcholine, which is the precursor for uh, all the cell membrane lipids uh, that are used to rebuild and, and regenerate cells. And then for those who are interested, there are a variety of uh, nutritional approaches to neuropathies. Some people have neuropathic injuries, um, and 
taking things, uh, you know, making sure you're getting the right phospholipids, cholesterol, lecithin, all these sort of myelinating compounds in your diet is important. So I, I have a, a topic discussed on the website about that. And, and then a few other things, for example, uh, for osteoarthritis, there's a lot of questions about chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine and MSM. I do discuss those on the website as well because I think it's relevant not just for osteoarthritis but also for preventing osteoarthritis um, and uh, also for tendon repair. There's some evidence that MSM may be beneficial in, in tendon repair as well. So uh, I discussed that, but the evidence, you know, is not is not great. Uh, but like I said, there's a lot of other uh, therapeutic avenues that we can take. So there's also a paragraph on the website that discusses natural anti-inflammatories. A lot of people have questions about turmeric and curcumin and uh, Boswellia and things like that. And uh, you know, there's there's good evidence for for those things for a variety of conditions. We're still sorting out what conditions they're best for, but uh, it's interesting because we have good medications to block the prostaglandin pathway, uh, to block cyclooxygenase uh, that comes through that inflammatory uh, side of the pathway from arachidonic acid, but these natural substances seem much better at inhibiting the other side of the pathway, which is the leukotrienes that form from arachidonic acid and and, uh, and lipoxygenase enzyme inhibitors. So those may be effective for certain conditions. We're still not 100% sure what conditions, but I think uh, there's there's a variety of inflammatory pathways that can be activated even apart from those ones. And 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 so we don't always know exactly what these inflammatory pathways are. They, they intersect with a lot of immune pathways and other signaling pathways. And, and so um, it's interesting to try to target uh, exactly what sort of these injury mechanisms and pain mechanisms are. Okay, so uh, I hope that was informative. I know it's not comprehensive and uh, I know it's not going to cure everything. That's why we have a billion other therapies to provide, but that gets uh, the most informative part of the discussion out of the way for most athletes. So um, hopefully this is helpful to whatever particular endeavor you're pursuing. And uh, if you have other questions or you want more information, please ask. The obligatory disclaimer, of course, is that this is not comprehensive and it may not apply to your particular circumstance and it should be um, assessed by a knowledgeable person who is aware of your entire health history, yada yada. And again, if you want more information or more references, uh, it's all listed on our website and we hope to keep adding information there because this is a continually evolving field. and. Uh, obviously will always be relevant to athletes. So uh, hopefully you can experiment with some of these things, tell me what works, what doesn't work, and, and uh, ask if there's anything else you're interested in talking about. We can certainly uh, discuss additional nutritional supplements. Anyway, I hope that helps and is interesting. Thank you. Talk to you later.